Hey guys, and welcome to the board. I wanted to go over my strategies for the Federation of Soul, starting off with a general overview, then going into tech and finishing it off with their agents and mechs. To be honest, I wasn't particularly excited to play Federation of Soul the first time I tried them, but once you kind of try them out, you're like, wow, this is, this is a crazy good faction. Their ability versatile is giving them one additional command token each round, and that's always going to be useful for you. There's no situational use of that. And it's kind of the equivalent of starting with hypermetabolism for free. The orbital drop on its face value is incredibly horrible because you're effectively paying a command token, which is about three influence for two infantry, and infantry normally cost one, so what the heck? But this does allow you to stall because it is an action. And this really makes this faction a very good Mechatol Rush faction because you can just continually drop infantry on Mechatol Rex. Orbital Drop also plays really well into one of their unique faction units, which is Spec Ops 1. Right out of the gate, instead of hitting on 8 or higher, their infantry hits on 7 or higher, which doesn't seem like a big deal. But from experience, infantry combat is such a slugfest that even just that one additional bonus that you get is a very big deal. Mitigated a little bit by the addition of mechs with Prophecy of Kings, but still. Looking at their upgrade for this, you now hit on six or higher. This makes their infantry equivalent to mechs, which is fantastic. And as a little bit of a kicker, normally unit upgrade two will revive your infantry when you roll six or higher. Instead, for Spec Ops 2, on a 5 or higher, your infantry are coming back into your home system on the next turn. It's probably worth noting that you do get 4 commodities, which is exceptional. The only one who beats you on that is Hakan. You're going to have a great economy playing this faction. Their second unique unit is the Advanced Carrier. This has 2 additional capacity compared to the normal carrier. The upgraded version of this allows 1 additional movement and a total of 8 capacity. Again, two over the normal upgrade. This also adds sustained damage, which is kind of a double-edged sword. It's kind of nice to have something that can take a hit without losing anything, but it does leave you a little vulnerable to a direct hit being used against you. But keep in mind that capacity is only checked after the combat's over. So if you're in the middle of a combat where you have tons of fighters, but you have two carriers, you can go ahead and sustain damage on a carrier, take that risk. As long as you know that after the combat's over, you're going to have capacity for the remaining fighters. Taking a look at their flagship, I always compare these to the Dreadnoughts, which Dreadnoughts hit on 5 or higher. So Soul's flagship of Genesis gets you those two hits on 5 or higher, so good there. It also has sustained damage, not quite as good as the Dreadnought 2 because you can upgrade that. But it has a whopping 12 capacity, which feeds into their theme of we can just truck around gigantic swarms of fighters and infantry like no other faction it also has a little bit of a kicker where at the end of the status phase you get to place one infantry from your reinforcements into the system space area i think the biggest downfall of this flagship is that it only has a movement of one like most other flagships do it can't quite keep up with your upgraded fleets later in the game I really like this faction because all of their abilities kind of come together into this cohesive, we're this Zerg type faction where we have ships that have massive capacity, which means we can field a ton of fighters, we can put out a ton of infantry, and our infantry are better than other factions. One of the biggest downfalls you're going to face, though, is your ability to produce that amount of units is limited by your space stock. You have a production capacity of your planet's resources plus two. Your starting planet has four resources on it. So that means you can produce six, which is pretty good, actually. But ideally, you're going to want to use construction in order to get additional space stocks on other planets to produce even more fighters and ground infantry and really churn out as many units as possible. I think Seoul has an incredibly clear destination in mind when it comes to tech path. Their advanced carrier with eight capacity to move is just too great to pass up. I mean, even just having one of these with eight fighters is a force to be reckoned with. 
The two prerequisites of blue aligns really well with Dreadnought 2, just requiring an additional yellow. So kind of while you're there, you might as well pick up Dreadnought 2 because that'll give you something that can bombard some planets if there's no PDSs there and also take up a free hit, potentially making it so you lose one less fighter. For starting tech, they have Neural Motivator, which is a fantastic starting tech. Right out of the gate, you get to draw two additional action cards. Combine this with your versatility of being able to get one extra command token each round, and you've got a really good economy right off the bat. Anti-mass deflectors really isn't that great of a starting technology, but if you look at our end goal, our carrier two require two blue techs. So this is one of the prerequisites we need in order to get to our final destination. I think the other blue tech you should pick up is definitely gravity drive. This is gonna combo really well with your flagship Genesis. It only has a move of one, which means it's gonna lag behind the rest of your fleet with your Dreadnought 2 and Carrier 2, both moving two. There's also other situations for this where maybe you really only need to move one with your flagship and your fleet, but there's a Carrier three spaces away that you can kind of, you know, lag behind a little bit and it'll help catch it up. And I think the path from Neural Motivator, Anti-Mass Deflectors, and into Carrier 2, Dread 2, is where it gets a lot more squishy in terms of what route you take. So let me go over a couple of different options and you can kind of play it by ear based on the game you're playing. I think the most straightforward path is by going into a yellow, which will get you the prerequisites for Dreadnought 2. Your options there are Scanlink Drone Network and Sarween Tools. I think Scanlink Drone Network, especially because you're going to want a space dock outside of your home system, is definitely going to be worth it for you. Um, being able to grab some extra relics or improve one of your planets, especially one that has a space dock on it, is going to be fantastic. Just be really careful that you don't do this on a cultural planet if demilitarization zone hasn't been played yet, because this will knock all of your structures off the planet, including your poor space dock. So the end result of this should be Gravity Drive, Scanlink Drone Network, Dreadnought 2, and Advanced Carrier 2. And that should leave you a little bit of room to pick up some optional tech. If you need to meet an objective, say two tech in two different colors, you can grab another yellow. Or maybe you need a third unit upgrade, you can go that path. Um, I'll go over a little bit more about kind of some optional tech or some good call out tech in a minute. I think the number of unit upgrades that you can get with your starting technology and AI development algorithms is just insane. You have Destroyer 2, Cruiser 2, PDS 2, and Spec Ops 2, all that you'll meet the prerequisites for. In addition to getting Dreadnought 2, as long as you get either a blue or a yellow tech, probably Gravity Drive or Scandrone Network, as we discussed before. I really like this path, not only because it opens up so many options for you, but because one of the vulnerabilities you have, actually you have two big ones. One is Assault Cannon. If your opponent has three or more ships, you immediately have to destroy one of your non-fighter ships. And if all you have in the battle are really expensive dreadnoughts and really expensive carriers, which you're relying on the capacity of the carrier to hold your fighters, and you're relying on the dreadnought to actually do some damage and take some hits, uh, salt cannons can be really nasty for you. You really want some cannon fodder in there in order to absorb some hits. The other weakness you have is anti-fighter barrage taking out all of your fighters, and it can be a little nasty. And if you yourself pick up Destroyer 2, you're kind of using your own weakness to your advantage because the Destroyer will fire anti-fighter barrage if you're playing against someone like Nalu, who will also have a ton of fighters there. And then during the fight itself, if you are fighting an opponent with Assault Cannon, you can just destroy a Destroyer 2. It's already kind of done its job of doing an anti-fighter barrage, and it's really cheap to get that back. It also has a move of two. It can keep up with your fleet. So I really, really like this combo. Of the other three unit upgrades, these are not nearly as nice. Spec Ops 2 is at least good if you get the objective to have two faction technologies. PDS 2, you may already have a bunch of these on the board just because you want to prevent your ground forces from being bombarded. So situational, but maybe good. Cruiser 2, you don't really need the capacity here. You're already going to have your beastly carriers and hopefully your flagship as well. 
So the biggest benefit here is either cannon fodder for assault cannon or the move three can be nice. I really enjoy the green tech line. I love economy. I think it is what wins you this game, especially when I see a faction that starts with neural motivators anyhow. Hyper metabolism comes straight to mind as a tech to get. But I think I do overvalue it a little bit because if you get it round two and the game ends by round five, you're really only looking at three command tokens. So you spend one to secondary tech and you spend four resources. So you're really only saving yourself like two. Eh, I definitely wouldn't get this if it's anything past round two. You got to get this early or don't get it at all. The other tech is Biostims which if you end up finding a really resource rich planet that gets a tech speciality added to it, this may be a good option for you as well. The trick here is knowing if you can pull off getting these economical technologies and also still getting up to Dreadnought 2 and Carrier 2. I wouldn't really jump at getting Lightwave Deflector too fast you can wait until the end of the game in order to see if it's going to be relevant or not. And especially if you have a blue tech skip or you're just in a really tech abundant game, you can grab this in order to maybe go grab an objective you need on the last round by moving through another player's ships. Speaking of moving through other players' ships, Fighter 2 is really nice because you can disperse fighters throughout the board and those will prevent other players from moving straight into your system. And fighters are really cheap to disperse, so that's really nice. But the real reason you'd really wanna get this is moving the combat value from a nine higher to an eight higher will make a huge difference if you have a large fighter screen going along those gigantic carriers that you have. So the mech for soul is definitely not as good as some of the other factions, but I actually really enjoy it because soul's all about having ground forces where it is you need them the most. And the Thunderbolt M2 is no exception. When you use your orbital drop to spend uh, one from your strategy pool and deploy two infantry, you can pay three to place a mech there. So you're, you're paying an opportunity cost of one in order to get a mech exactly where you want it. This means you're going to be really good at reinforcing your front lines as you expand and slowly leave infantry behind. Or you can just drop this on a planet that's really important for you to defend. Maybe one of your opponents is putting a fleet next door and you're getting a little, uh, you know, scared. Or you probably more likely use case is you just want to dump a ton of infantry on Mechatol Rex and hold that for a while. I think between your mechs being exactly where they need to be most of the time, you having tons of ground forces, your ground forces being better than most, your huge carrying capacity. You don't really need your agent's ability too much. The ability to roll one extra die in a ground combat, eh, it's kind of nice for you. But it's even better if you can sell it to someone else, because especially if they have a mech in the area, one extra die during a combat round can be really important to them. And you can maybe get a trade good or two off of them for your agent's ability. I really like the Soul's Promissory Note because it allows another player to put two infantry on a planet that they control, and that is almost always useful to another player. The gotcha here is if you have a command token in your strategy pool, you end up losing it. So you want to play around this a little bit by only giving it to another player when your strategy pool is empty. So what I would suggest doing is at the start of your turn, offer this to other players for two trade goods, maybe one since they can immediately play it that will prevent a player from being a bit spiteful holding on to it and waiting for you to have something in your strategy pool token and you can also dictate hey i want the infantry to go on this or that planet right off the bat your home world has four resources on it so in order to unlock your commander you really only need to find eight more resources on planets abyss Frio would give you five that means you need three more you should probably find at least a little bit as you're exploring, especially if you go the Scanlink drone network route. So this commander shouldn't be too difficult to unlock. Once she's unlocked at the start of a ground combat on a planet you control, you place an additional infantry from your reinforcements on that planet. Effectively, what this commander says is every single planet you own has an additional infantry on it. 
And considering ground combat can be a little rough sometimes, this can be pretty useful. But compared to some of the other commander abilities that I've seen, I don't think this is the greatest, which makes sense. They probably use this as an opportunity to power down Soul a little bit. I really enjoy the Hero of Soul because, well, it's not as flashy as many of the other heroes where you do this really awesome game-changing thing. It is always going to be useful to you, I think. The ability to remove each of your command tokens from the game board and return them to your reinforcements, effectively doing warfare on everywhere on the board, I can't imagine a game where I wouldn't want to use this or I wouldn't have a situation where this would be useful. The other thing I really enjoy about this is because you're removing all your command tokens from the board, you're not making it obvious to other players exactly where it is you need to move. So they can't really dethrone you by stopping you from doing what it is you need to do. I hope you guys enjoyed me talking to myself about a make-believe game in, made of cardboard. Thanks. Have a good day. Oh, yeah, uh, like and subscribe, so that kind of stuff. Uh, talk to you guys later.